Hello and welcome back to Wine Reform. So today I am really excited to share a new wine with you guys. I, as some of you may know, am studying uh, WSET level two. That's the second level on my way to holding a wine diploma. Anyway, I have been learning quite a bit about wines in France and wines in Italy, especially. Well, I guess France, Italy, and the United States and Spain. Okay, there's gotta be more, right? Well, there is. So I am excited to share with you guys a wine from Greece. Now in the United States, at least, I've noticed a serious lack of Greek wine being represented in a lot of liquor stores just in my own town. I did, however, go to a very special store. I went to the wine cellar in Monument. Dirk was super duper helpful. He showed me what I was looking for right away and he has phenomenal knowledge. So it's a wine from Greece, but what is it today? we are trying, Asirtiko. So Asirtiko is probably like the poster child for Greek wine. And after doing a bit of research, it's a really fascinating grape. So I'm so excited to crack this open and give it a go. Now it's a white wine grape that is native to Santorini in Greece. Santorini is one of the islands on the Aegean and it's actually a desert climate and it's very windy. The entire island is sort of made of uh, volcanic rock. A really fascinating terroir already. We've got a very interesting climate we're working with. Assyrtiko is a really interesting grape because of not only where it's grown, but also how it can be expressed. It kind of ranges from fresh and citrusy and minerally to something a bit more rich and nutty and fragrant. It really depends on how the winemaker chooses to express that grape. Whether they choose to make it a young wine or an aged wine, or they age it in concrete or stainless steel or oak, or whether they choose to make the wine sweet or dry, or whether they blend it with other grapes or make it a single varietal. The profile of the grape can change a lot depending on how it was made. So I've done a little research. I'll put the links to everything I found below. Uh, in Greece, Assyrtiko is often blended with Athiri and Aidani. And uh, those are also, those are two other Grecian wine grapes. More than other wines, Assyrtiko is very susceptible to oxidation. So I've touched a little bit on this with the tawny port in my last episode, but oxidation is basically when oxygen comes in contact with a wine and kind of turns it brown. Sometimes this can ruin a wine, but with some wines that can introduce interesting new flavors into the mix, there really is a sort of fine line between too much and just enough, uh, depending on what you're looking for, and it's up to the winemaker. So, all right, a little bit about Assyrtiko. Assyrtiko vines on Santorini are actually really neat because not only how they're grown, but because they were actually protected from the phylloxera louse. During, I blanked, but during insert time period here, the phylloxera louse was a pest that actually ravaged all the grapevines um, in most of Europe. In fact, in order to protect those well, varietals, a lot of viticulturists and arachnologists had to actually graft a tougher uh, grape variety to these original varietals in order to keep the plant going. But because of the volcanic soil on Santorini, the Asirtico was protected from this phylloxera louse. So there are vines growing there that never had to be grafted in order to survive. Some of those vines are even over 70 years old, and that's probably some of the oldest vines in Greece. So in Santorini, I mentioned it is an island that is hot, it is dry, it is windy, and the ground is volcanic rock. These don't sound like very habitable conditions, do they? Well, the viticulturists in Santorini have figured out a method in order to grow their Asirtiko grapes in this uninhabitable climate. What they use is the Colara method. I'm gonna put the um, I'm gonna put the word somewhere here so that you can bing bing bing. There you go. So what they do is they train the vines to grow into these baskets, and these baskets they will train the bunches to flower and fruit on the inside of this basket. Another thing they do because there's not a lot of fresh water to be had is they will space these baskets of. Uh, Asirtiko vines much farther apart in order to conserve that water. So here's the Kalara method. And then in other places in Greece where they grow Asirtiko, it looks more like this. Really, really neat stuff. 
fascinating viticulture technique, or viticultural technique, all the more reason to give it attention. It is also worth noting that um, because of the maritime climate, that humidity and that fog, those do help the grapes. So I think that without that, it would be a little tougher to regulate this acidifico. Now this grape is only in very recent years recognized more internationally. I found some really neat articles by Decanter and other websites I'll link below of these winemakers from other countries actually taking some of the acidifico cuttings from Greece and bringing them back to their home countries um, where they had similar enough conditions to try to cultivate the grape there. A cutting was propagated from the Aguiros estate in Santorini by uh, Jim Berry Wines, and Jim Berry is in Australia, in the Clare Valley. There's also some acidifico growing at the Abbey of New Clairvaux in Northern California. And according to a 2016 article by Decanter, the acidifico is being evaluated to see if it can be grown in Italy's Alto Adige region. It is also worth mentioning that Jordan Wines in Stellenbosch, uh, South Africa, has also propagated a cutting and they're in the process of cultivating it now. I'm so excited. We are trying our Zacharias Winery's 2019 Asirtico. So Zacharias Winery is not in Santorini, but is in Namia, Greece. So that's on the mainland. The winery and the vineyard has been around since the 1960s. It wasn't until 2007 when the uh, Zacharias family revamped the, uh, well, the whole operation. I think that's enough talk. That's a lot of information to digest. Again, there's so much more fascinating things to learn about this particular varietal, and we are just scratching the surface of Greek wines right now, and I can't wait to delve deeper. But for now, we are gonna go ahead and open the bottle and do our little wine evaluation. I have positioned the camera, so now you can see kind of what I'm doing. So we've got it open, I have poured a sample, and there is a tad bit of natural effervescence in there already. All right, so the first thing we do when we evaluate a wine is we look at it. Wowie zowie. That is so pale. I would say it's a pale yum Yemen yellow, pale lemon yellow. And in terms of the color intensity, it is so light. I can barely see any color at all towards the edges. Yeah, it almost looks kind of watery and clarity is impeccable. Step number two, when we are evaluating wine, is we smell it. So I mentioned that the flavor profile or aroma profile rather for acirtico can vary greatly depending on where the grapes were grown and how the winemaker chose to express said grape. It looks really pale so I'm probably expecting something much drier, minerally, and citrusier. if that makes any sense. So let's see what I get. Ooh, that smells good. I'm definitely getting lemon, strong lemon rind. I'm really getting that minerality in the form of a kind of briny salt. So there's like table salt, but the salt you smell from the ocean has a bit of brine to it. That's what this smells like. A very faint grassiness to it, but it's so faint. It's much more stronger in the citrus and the mineral notes, so very light acirtico. And the aroma is, even though this is a really pale wine, the aroma is actually really intense. Um, which I think is kind of cool. And I'm getting something else in there that smells almost a little bit like nutritional yeast. So now that we have sniffed our wine, we get to taste it. Ooh. So the first tip is always to prime your palate. Pro tip, don't have anything strong before you're tasting a wine because say for example, you had a cup of coffee or even a cup of tea before tasting wine. The flavor from that drink is going to linger in your mouth and it's going to sort of impair your judgment. Even if you haven't had anything um, strong to eat or drink right before drinking wine, I highly recommend you drink some water and then use the first sip to prime your palate and the second sip to evaluate. So second sip, cool. I got strong lemon, which is, in my opinion, quite delicious. I got that strong brine and a little bit of almost like a honeycomb. It wasn't quite sweet honey sort of taste or flavor, but it was just enough so, I guess I would call it honeycomb. The acidity, what a zinger, or how you can tell if something's really acidic or not, or just how acidic it is. Oh, well, it's gonna look kind of weird. 
Uh -huh. It looks weird. Trust me, wine is weird, but we love it. You can tell how acidic something is by using the sides of your tongue, especially towards the back, and how much you salivate as a metric. And I gotta say, as soon as I took a sip of that, they kind of just zing, you know? The acidity is actually what makes a wine refreshing. So even though it was very acidic, it did feel refreshing. The finish was very long. Um, obviously it's a white wine, so no tannin. And the body, it was a very light bodied wine though. No, I'm gonna say medium body. This is actually really, really delicious. That's really good. Yeah, I can see this pairing well with a lot of food. Obviously not super heavy food, but I could see you pairing it with salty foods, salads, things with high acidity to speak of. Tomato and basil and mozzarella, this would complement that so beautifully. I can see this working really well with a lot of seafood. I think I would try it with sushi. I think this would taste fantastic with any sort of grilled white fish. I think it would taste amazing with salty cheese salty chips, salty food. So because a Cirtico is not a wine that is nearly as common in the States, though I hope more people drink it because it's so good. I would say that if you're a fan of very zingy Sauvignon Blanc and maybe you like the body of Chardonnay, I think you would appreciate giving a Cirtico a try. First of all, I can see myself enjoying this in the summer. This wine really makes me want to sit in the sun. I think that if I was to go to brunch with a bunch of pals, I love brunch by the way, I miss brunch. If I was to go to brunch with a bunch of pals, I would absolutely order a glass of this to go with a more savory brunch option. I think this wine would pair really well with either, if you can get it, a nice day in the sun, whether it be at the beach or a garden or in the desert, or if you can't get that, I think it would pair very well with uh, a weekend of watching Sex in the City and <laughs> eating salty snacks. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Wine Reform. Um, I think I'm gonna call this one I got it. I'm gonna call this segment Wines Around the World, and I think that it'll be fun to maybe introduce more of us to more wines. So if you liked what you saw, be sure to give me a thumbs up. And if you really liked what you saw and you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe. Uh, I put videos out every Friday, and God forbid I miss a week because of, or miss a day because of, I don't know, a freak storm or no Wi-Fi or oversleeping, hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button and you will be notified when I put out a video. I am probably gonna go find something salty to eat and I am probably going to go figure out why I can watch Sex in the City because this wine makes me crave it. Well, like the show. Yeah, you know what I mean. Anyway, okay, bye!